Welcome back to this, the next talk in the series, Genesis, the first three chapters. Now, whatever we make of the literary genre of the opening chapters of Genesis, one thing is abundantly clear, that what is described there in terms of human behaviour is indicative of the rather futile practice that uh, many of us engage in, trying to hide away from God. Now, the text for today comes from chapter 3, verses 8 to 10. The Madden and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to them, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Now this is after the fall. Now any parent with a naughty child will be very familiar with those responses, that full range of responses that you encounter in chapter 3 of Genesis. It's rather infantile notion of hiding away from somebody who actually knows the truth. We all do it. So it's a bit unfair to children to say it's infantile. We all do it. It's ridiculously futile to think that we could ever live our lives outside the gaze and knowledge of God. Maybe this is what King David had in mind when he penned Psalm 139. And in it, you get familiar phrases like this. David saying, you are familiar with all my ways. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Now, it might be that David had in mind a sort of commentary on the situation in Genesis chapter 3 with Adam. Or maybe it was a commentary on his own life or a combination of both. But it's in the very heart of God to be engaged in search and rescue. Now the search and rescue didn't start in uh, 1656 with the attempt to save survivors from a Dutch ship. No, search and rescue is at the very heart of God. And it's part of the very mandate of the Son of God, God incarnate, where he tells us that in Luke's Gospel, chapter 19, that God came for the very purpose of seeking and saving that which was lost. At this point, it might be worth saying a bit about chapter 15 of Luke. In chapter 15 of Luke, we get three parables, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. And Jesus told those in response to a criticism that had been levelled against him. You'll remember at the beginning of that chapter, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law criticised Jesus for keeping the company of outcasts and sinners. Now, effectively, what was happening was this, four things, really. Firstly, they were thinking this itinerant preacher claims to be God's man from God. Secondly, our assessment of God is that he despises sinners, thought the Pharisees. Thirdly, this man welcomes sinners. QED, therefore, Jesus must be a fraud because God would never approve of this sort of behaviour, welcoming sinners. And when Jesus told the stories, the three stories, the lost sheep, the lost coin and the lost son, he was effectively correcting their error. The stories amounted to Jesus saying to these guys, I'm going to tell you what God is like. And he proceeded to outline the three parables. You see, God is in the recovery business. He's in the search and rescue business at the very heart of his being. And that's what transpires in those three parables. I don't know if you know the child's game or children's game, hide and seek, but when the hunter is ready, he'll say, coming ready or not, he's counted up to 20 or whatever it is, coming ready or not. And that's exactly God's approach to his errant children, to his wayward children. Even in that parable of the lost son, you can imagine the father's nose pressed up against the window pane, looking out daily for the return of his wayward son, this younger son. God's pursuit of humanity is evoked by that famous Francis Thompson poem, The Hound of Heaven. It was first published in 1893. And one commentator says of this poem, I quote, 
As the hound follows the hare, never ceasing in its running, ever drawing nearer in the chase, with unhurrying and unperturbed pace, so does God follow the fleeing soul by his divine grace. And the opening lines of the poem by Thompson uh, says it all. I fled him. I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind. And in the midst of tears, I hid from him. When John Stott, that famous Bible teacher, uh, wrote the book um, Why I Am a Christian, it told his own story. The opening chapter was called The Hound of Heaven. And it particularly evokes this Thompson poem. That was his experience, being chased down by a loving God, a gracious God. As in Genesis, man hides and God seeks out. Such is redeeming love. There's one other feature of what was said by Adam in Genesis 3. When he was feeling shameful and he made this futile attempt to hide from God, he said, I was afraid. Now, is that a regrettable response or is it a commendable response? When Jesus was comforting his disciples who were experiencing increasing animosity from the religious authorities, he said this to them, look, don't be afraid of man. The one you should be afraid of is God. But in that same chapter, he goes on to explain the very one of whom they should be afraid, God, actually loves them with great passion, with great grace and kindness. So fear, fearing God in the words of Jesus, isn't to be petrified, isn't to cower away, isn't to try and hide away. Fear of God is to hold him in awesome respect. So there you go, Genesis chapter 3, Adam seeking to hide from God and God seeking, God, seeking Adam out such as the divine grace which compels him to be engaged in this search and rescue. Something for you to consider or discuss. Can I suggest that you read and prayerfully reflect upon Psalm 139 and review your own experience in the light of that psalm. Well, thank you for listening and watching and look out for the next in the series, Genesis, the first three chapters.